Boldwood presents A Christmas Wedding in the Cotswolds, written by Lucy Coleman and read by Lucy Scott. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. June Prologue My name is Immy Tolliman. When I was 14 years old, I moved to Lockkeeper's Cottage in Aysbury to live with my grandfather, Ernest Tolliman. Having recently lost my dad, I was one angry and rebellious teen, and Grandad, known affectionately to everyone, including me, as Tolly, was also grieving. Losing his son made him miss Grandma Nell even more. As time went on, I realised how disruptive my presence had been and that he'd put up with me out of sheer love for his then wayward granddaughter. Eventually, an easy peace began to grow between us, and over the years, that has turned into admiration and mutual respect. We saw each other through the tough times, and that is a special bond we feel blessed to share. The highlight of the year for the little community of Aysbury, located in the picturesque Cotswolds, is without doubt the Santa Ahoy Christmas Cruises, run in aid of local charities, and this year is a special one indeed. It's the tenth anniversary of something that has turned a group of friends into family, inspired by my granddad. Tolly is Aysbury's very own Santa Claus, with myself as the chief elf and two helpers, Jade and Jude, my fiancé Grey Adams as the handsome captain, and a wider team beavering away in the background. The cruises kickstart everyone's Christmas. The community is spread out over a wide area, but there is a small group of locals who live within walking distance of the Aysbury Junction Marina. The nature of a marina is that many of the boats moored there long term have owners who appear infrequently throughout the year. However, there are also a handful of permanent berths. Together with the families who run the Bullrush Inn and the Lockside Nurseries, there's always a helping hand on offer. Tolly who was the manager of the marina for 25 years, has a theory that Aysbury is a collection of waifs and strays, and he's proud to count himself amongst them. People have ended up here in desperate need of something, more often than not, without having a clue about what exactly that elusive something might be. Perhaps it's a sense of community, the feeling of belonging somewhere, especially if that's never been true before, either because they don't have close family, or they've struggled to conform. People stay because they feel they can at last put down roots. Round pegs, square holes, as Tolly often says. That's why we fit together so well and make a cracking team. We're all in the same boat. We've learned to respect the fact that one's past is not what defines you. The secrets people choose not to divulge are a private matter. But whenever a problem arises, there is always someone willing to listen. And it's the choices people make as each new day dawns that matter. Shortly after last Christmas, Tolly moved into my former home, a barn conversion known as The Retreat, which is in the garden of Lockkeeper's Cottage. Gray and I are making Tolly's dream come true, to see the old cottage brought up to date and turned into a home of our own. But things are not going quite as smoothly as I'd hoped. Chapter One No, 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 no! Leaning forward until my forehead is resting on the desktop in front of me, I let out an exasperated groan. My phone is still firmly grasped in my hand, but, having read the message twice over, I can't even bring myself to respond. Hi, Amy. Bad news, I'm afraid. Main's water pipe has fractured. Give me an hour to get things under control, and then could you pop in? Tolly has a spare room, right? The message is from Reggie, the foreman in charge of the building works at the cottage, and he's obviously preparing me for the worst. Oops, so sorry. Um, Are you feeling all right? The sound of an unfamiliar voice forces me to pull myself together quickly, and I sit up, pushing back my shoulders in a determined way. Opening the drawer alongside me, I throw the phone inside and shut it with a snap. Yes, I'm fine. How can I help? My smile as I turn is half-hearted, but it's the best I can do. 
A water problem at Lockkeeper's Cottage feels like the final straw today, and it's only 11 a.m. The kindly-looking older man standing in front of me stares back hesitantly, looking as if he doesn't know whether to stay or go. He shifts from one foot to the other, uneasily. I'm uh, here to see Martin, but I'm a bit early, I'm afraid. The poor man looks so apologetic that I jump up, wondering what on earth he must think of my behaviour. Oh, of course, Patrick Hurst, isn't it? I hold out my hand in a welcoming gesture. I'm Imogen Tolliman, but everyone calls me Immy. Please, take a seat. Martin is running a little late, I'm afraid. I'll organise us a cup of tea, or coffee. It's the first time I've met Martin's business adviser, who, according to him, has taken a huge weight off his shoulders over the past year. Very nice to meet you at last, Immy. Martin talks about you all the time. I really don't want to put you out. It looks like you've had some bad news. A fractured water main isn't the best text to get on a Monday morning, but I'm sure my builders will be able to sort it out. It's not the fix I'm worried about, but the cost. Patrick wrinkles his brow. Oh dear, now I understand. I'd be banging my head on the desk too. If you're sure I'm not interrupting you, a cup of tea would be most welcome, thanks. I leave him to take a seat and head into the Lockside Nursery's small kitchen. It's quiet in the back offices this morning, as the delivery vans are doing their rounds, and everyone else is either on the shop floor or working in the greenhouses. When I head back to my office, the sign on the door still makes me smile. The decision to take on the newly created full-time position of assistant manager in January of this year was a big step for me. I don't regret giving up my other part-time job, working as office administrator for the manager of Aysbury Marina, Everyone around here refers to him as Fisher, as the surname is so apt. I'm closer to him than most. I regard him as family. But with another local resident, Valerie Price, now sitting at my old desk, I know that I've left him in good hands. Nudging open the door with my foot, I step back inside my office. But Patrick isn't seated. He's studying the notice board. You start planning for Christmas early? he remarks, pointing to the string of glittery white snowflakes. Yes, my granddad Tolly runs the Santa Ahoy Cruises. It's the tenth anniversary this year, and we're trying to raise enough money to build a children's playground. I pass Patrick a mug of tea, which he takes gratefully as he eases himself down onto the spare chair alongside the desk. Ah, I've heard something about that. Christmas has never been a big thing for my wife and I. Um, soon to be ex-wife, that is. We always dine out on Christmas Day. Being just the two of us, it was easier. He replies rather soberly. I don't quite know how to respond, as Christmas was always a magical time for me growing up, and now in adulthood, I keep that tradition going. Christmas isn't just for children. It's about surrounding yourself with the people you want to spend time with, and it's sad to think of the fun that Patrick and his wife missed out on over the years. He looks as if he's carrying a huge weight on his shoulders, and his brow seems to be permanently furrowed. He's a troubled man, and I can't help wondering what his story is. The tea is perfect. Thank you, Emmy. Do you live locally? Yes, my fiancé, Gray, and I are renovating Lockkeeper's Cottage. It's the property set back from the towpath on the other side of the canal, this morning's news could be rather inconvenient, to say the least. Patrick places his mug down on the desk, shaking his head. I'm really sorry to hear that. It's a major work in progress, then? I manage a genuine smile this time. Yes, Gray works in London, and I don't relish the thought of telling him that we might have to move out, or, rather, back into our former home for a while. You're lucky to have that option. It's a barn conversion built in the garden of the cottage, but Tolly lives there now. Patrick laughs. Ooh, tough one. You do get on with your granddad, I hope. Oh, Tolly is the best. He took me in after my dad died, and he put up with me through my tantrums and angst when I was the teenager from hell. That can't have been easy for either of you. You don't get on with your mum? Patrick inquires, his voice full of empathy. I lost contact with her early on in my life, but that's a long story. Now there's nowhere else I'd rather be. It just took me a while to realize how lucky I am. 
You sound like a fighter, Emmy, and I'm sure you'll get through this. He tips his mug at me before taking a slurp. You're not the one getting married at Christmas, are you? I am. That's brave, considering the snowstorms we had last year. Well, it was going to be a summer wedding, I reply. But Gray composes music, and he's involved in recording a film score. It's been all go. And what with the fundraising we've been doing? Well, there aren't enough hours in the day, and we had to move the date. Poor man. He's a good listener, and I must sound like a real whinger. But stress is now affecting the way I react to every little drama that arises, which isn't like me at all. Hey, where's that smile gone? Patrick asks, giving me a wink. His genial attempt to lift my mood works, and the corners of my mouth instantly curl upwards. It's kind of you to listen to me wittering on like this, Patrick. I must sound like a crazy woman, I reply, laughing. There are moments when we all need to let stuff out in me, so don't worry about it. It's been happening to me a fair bit lately, too. It isn't easy, but life goes on, and somehow we manage to get through each little crisis. I catch a sudden movement out of the side of my eye, and the boss appears. Martin Williams is a good man to work for, and he took me on as a Saturday helper at the tender age of sixteen. I had never touched a plant in my life at that point, and he taught me everything I know. Understanding what happens out in the massive greenhouses really helps when you are the assistant manager, and now I run the office while Martin is out, being the face of the company. He's a real family man and has a kind heart, which is why I love working for him. Oh, what I give for a cup of tea, Martin comments as he steps forward to shake Patrick's hand. Sincere apologies for keeping you waiting, Patrick. I got stuck in a long queue of cars crawling along behind a tractor. No problem at all. I was a bit early, and it's great to finally meet Emmy. Especially after I've heard so much about her, I can now see why business is booming. Patrick glances at me, a hint of a smile easing his frown for a brief moment before his face settles back into serious mode. Convincing Emmy to work here full time was the best move I ever made. She's much more organized than I am when it comes to the paperwork, and things run without a hitch now. It's because of her that I can get out there and make new contacts. Anyway, I suppose we'd better start crunching numbers then, Patrick. He gives Martin a nod, then turns back to face me. Thank you for the tea and the chat, Emmy. Much appreciated. Hopefully our paths will cross again before too long. With a bit of luck, the builders will get your problem sorted quickly. Martin screws up his face. Oh, no, not another delay, he declares. Yeah, just another Monday morning blip to start off the week, and it sounds like Reggie is preparing me for the worst. For you, Martin replies sadly. I'm here for the rest of the day, so if you need to make yourself scarce for a couple of hours, feel free, Emmy. We'll catch up later. Thanks, Martin. Appreciate it. As they head out of the office, I'm not sure what to do first. Jeez, I hope this week isn't going to go downhill from here, as I'm not sure I have the stamina right now. Why do I always take on too much? You would think I'd have learnt my lesson by now. My phone pings, and it's a message from my best friend Sarah at the Bullrush Inn. Hi, sweetie. Any decisions yet on the final menu for the wedding buffet? Kiss, kiss. Sarah is right, of course. I do need to get my act together. Every time I sit down with a wedding folder, something else crops up. I'm not usually so easily distracted, and the truth is that I need rescuing. Then an idea pops into my head. It's time to reach out to someone capable of pulling this together for me, and I think I know just the person to ask. Something must be up to see you on my doorstep at this time on a Monday. Come on in, Val says as she swings open the door to buy a cottage. It always smells nice in here, a mixture of freshly baked goodies and a fragrance. Often, it's from the fresh flowers Val picks from the garden, but sometimes from the essential oils she uses in a small diffuser. Ziggy, Val's beautiful Bengal cat, comes running out of the study and begins to wind herself around my feet. She has an entire conversation with me as I bend to stroke her, and I give her a meow back. Ziggy begins purring and tilts her head to let me stroke her chin. She is such a character. I'm sorry to disturb you, as I know it's almost lunchtime, so it's just a quick visit, I promise. Val looks over my shoulder fleetingly, as if she's expecting someone. I'm, uh, 
sure that Fisher would forgive me if I was running a little late because of you, she responds laughing. Anyway, the cheese and olive scones I'm baking have only just gone into the oven. They smell delicious. And if you take him one, he'll forgive you anything. Anyway, I wanted to talk to you about wedding stuff. Val shuts the door behind me and ushers me through to the sitting room. Have you eaten? She asks. Can you stay for a quick lunch? Thanks, but regrettably it has to be a no. I'm on my way back to Lockkeeper's Cottage as the water main has fractured. Val's reaction is one of dismay. Oh, Immy, I'm gutted for you. Just when it looked like the worst of the building work was behind you. That's devastating news. Is there anything I can do to help? Without thinking, I let out a huge sigh, and she indicates for me to take a seat on the sofa. This wedding is beginning to feel like the final straw, I blurt out, and then realize how awful that sounds. Val looks at me, shocked, her expression pained. Oh, nothing's wrong, please don't think that. Gray and I are both fine, and it's all wonderful still, but who has time to fuss over flowers and menu choices and... I run out of steam, taking a moment to catch my breath. Just tell me what you want doing, and I'll do it. You know that, Immy. Val's voice is full of concern. I need an official wedding planner, someone who can make sense of what still needs to be done to make it all happen. She smiles sympathetically, gently lowering herself down onto the sofa opposite me. You want me to find someone for you? She inquires gently. Um, not exactly. I was wondering whether you have time to take on the role. You trust me to do that? But I've never been involved in planning a wedding before, she replies. However, I can tell by the gleam in her eyes that she's pleased I'm reaching out to her. I'm desperate, Val. Everyone assumes a bride knows exactly what she wants, but I find it overwhelming. I don't want to disappoint Grey, but I have no idea what I'm doing. I need someone I can rely upon to draw up a master plan, or this wedding is going to be a total disaster. The answer is yes, of course. She replies with real enthusiasm. It will be my pleasure. The problem is that I don't even know where to start, Val, as I'm being pulled in so many different directions, and that isn't going to ease up any time soon. You know me. I'm not one to let things slide, and if I do, it means I'm losing my grip. With Grey away during the week, the only quality time we get is at the weekend. And I'm taking on more and more at work to ease the pressure on Martin. Plus, having to liaise with the builders and being chief organiser and treasurer for the Santa Ahoy Anniversary Fund, I'm like a headless chicken. We're halfway through the year, and as far as the wedding plans go, I've booked Aysbury Village Hall for the civil ceremony and the reception, with the Bull Rush Inn doing their catering. But we don't even have a menu or a guest list yet, and Sarah texted me again this morning to give me a nudge. I sink back onto the sofa, feeling deflated and demoralised. Don't you worry about a thing, Emmy. Give me whatever lists you have, and if we can take an hour one evening to sit down and talk through your vision, I'll get things moving. My chin wavers a little as I give her a look full of gratitude and relief. Hey, don't get upset. There are other people we can pull in to help once we have an action plan. But you will need to be on hand to make some firm decisions quite quickly. I'm sorry the original plan for a summer wedding hasn't been doable because of Gray's workload. I know you were both disappointed about that. I sit forward, shrugging my shoulders. This is his big break, and I wasn't about to make life difficult for him. I sigh wearily. I wanted a simple service in a cornfield alongside the canal, with a small group of friends and a big party for everyone in a marquee afterwards. The village hall is nice, but it's not quite the same, is it? Val chews her lip deep in thought. And Grey definitely doesn't want to slip it back another six months to next summer? There's so much going on and you're carrying a lot on your shoulders, Immy. I know. But all we really want is a quiet little wedding with close friends and neighbours. Grey feels guilty that I insisted on pushing back the date to take the pressure off him. But I'm totally in love with the idea of a Christmas wedding. After all, we did get engaged at Christmas and it is my favourite time of the year. That makes us both burst out laughing. You did, Val says, grinning at me. 
It wasn't quite the romantic occasion you'd hoped for, though, was it? That's precisely why I need your help. My perfect plans went awry, didn't they? But, I hold up my ring finger, proudly displaying Grandma's engagement ring, we pulled it off. A wedding, though, is an entirely different thing, and I'm floundering. I want it to be a memory Gray and I will cherish forever. But at this rate, it's going nowhere. Have you at least thought about a wedding dress? I stare back at her miserably, and Val sucks in a deep breath, shaking her head. Oh, Immy, we need to sort the basics as quickly as possible, and then it's a case of attending to the finer details. I'll do some surfing online, as there will be websites with lots of handy tips and checklists. That would be amazing, Val. I can't thank you enough for coming to my rescue. I'm excited to be involved, she replies, sounding a little emotional. I'll give Rona a call too, as we can't leave out Gray's mum. I think she'll be thrilled to be a part of it. What if the three of us meet up one evening this week to start the ball rolling? Perfect. Just let me know what works for you two and I'll bring along the wedding folder. There isn't a lot in there, I'm afraid, but the upside is that it won't take long to bring you up to speed. I give her a sheepish look, but Val's smile doesn't waver. Well, that will make things easier. Once I've spoken with Rona, I'll text you. Right, off you go and don't give it another thought. Just focus on whatever's gone wrong today down at Lockkeeper's Cottage. We stand, and I give her a grateful hug. Thank you for coming to my rescue. I know it sounds awful, as my wedding should be the main priority, but Tolly and the whole crew have worked so hard to make this tenth anniversary mean something. So many people are involved, and the money is coming in, but we have a long way to go with the fundraising if we're to meet our target. I really need to focus on it, as there is still so much to be done to make it all happen. I know, Immy. There's no need to explain. Just know that everyone appreciates what you're doing. Don't forget to rely more heavily on other members of the committee, though. You're shouldering way too much, and there's no shame in delegating. A meaningful look passes between us. Tolly is 87 years young, and he's still sprightly. But one thing life has taught both myself and Val is never to take anything for granted. We both know that's why I want to make sure everything goes smoothly. Well, you're a real star, and Grey will be relieved to hear help is on hand. It's quiet when Grey isn't around, she muses. You must miss his constant tapping as a tune runs through his head, and the habit he has of humming when he's thinking is so endearing. Oh, I do, and it's one of the things I love about him, his passion for music. However, it's catching, and I often end up having the same little tune stuck inside my head too. It can be very distracting at times. Anyway, I must go. I'm just about to break the news to Tolly that, unless there's a quick fix for this latest problem, Gray and I could well be knocking on his door and hoping he'll take pity on us. Val's eyes widen. Oh dear, it's not the best start to your week. No, but it's not all bad news this morning, is it? Thanks to you. The sense of relief I'm feeling is enough to lift my spirits and fortify me for what lies ahead. Chapter Two I can feel a headache coming on. I head away from Byer Cottage. The Bullrush Inn is en route, and it's unlikely I'll be able to sneak past without being seen, so I decide to pop in to reassure Sarah that a decision will be made about the menu by the beginning of next week. Sarah and Kurt, the owners of the Bullrush, and their twin daughters, Jade and Jude, will also be guests, which adds another complication to our planning. Aside from the summer season, Christmas is their busiest time of year, and catering for a wedding is an additional pressure. Pushing open the door and walking inside, the smells wafting out from the kitchen remind me how hungry I am. A low grumble from my stomach confirms that, but unfortunately, this can only be a flying visit. I scan around, but I can't see any familiar faces, as it's still a little early for lunch. At this time of the day, the custom is usually made up of couples out for a walk along the canal, grateful to find a place that serves hearty home-cooked food and the popular all-day breakfast. Sometimes there are day raters around who have rented a berth for a night or two while they explore the surrounding area. It's always a bonus to be able to take a break from cooking on board, and the bull rush's reputation has travelled far and wide. 
Here she is, then, Kurt calls out as he pushes through the swing doors, carrying a tray of condiments. How's it going, Immy? Are you here to eat, or are you looking for Sarah? Kurt and Sarah are one of the friendliest couples I know, and when they arrived in Aysbury, the girls had just turned seven. Now they're 14 years old. It took Kurt and Sarah 18 months to completely renovate the place, and it wasn't an easy time, as they did the majority of the work themselves. While juggling the demands of two very lively little girls, they managed to keep the cafe open while the major building works were in progress. They succeeded in turning this place into the beating heart of our community. Jude and Jade are a credit to their hard-working parents, learning from a young age how a little help can go a long way. A cafe and gift shop by day, every Friday, Saturday and Sunday evening between 6 to 10 p.m., the Bull Rush is the haunt of the Aysbury Junction Marina Anchor Club members. With the celebrated Middle Norton Brewing Company just a short journey away, the variety of beers on offer has become quite an attraction. I suspect that some of the club members have never taken the helm of a boat as captain, but they all enjoy trips out on the waterways and canals. Everyone is welcome, and it's good to see those familiar faces, despite the fact they don't all live on the doorstep. And whenever there's a litter pick or work to be done that benefits the marina, they turn up to lend a hand. Now that's a club worth joining in my book. I'm just popping in to let Sarah know that I'll email her by the end of the week once my wedding planner and I have had a chat. The look Kurt gives me is classic, and he replies in a semi-hushed tone, Oh, you have a wedding planner? I nod enthusiastically, well, hopefully too, as Val intends to enlist Rona's help to get things moving. Sarah appears behind him just in time to overhear our conversation. Thank goodness for that. You have way too much on your plate, Emmy. It's about time you reached out for a little support. I'll email you a selection of menus we've used in the past. You can mix and match or simply create your own buffet. It's entirely up to you. I know how busy you are, but it would be helpful if you could give me a firm number before too long. I know, I reply, hanging my head. My guest list is done, but I'll press Gray again when he turns up on Friday night. She gives me a knowing smile. Oh, don't pounce on him as soon as he arrives. I feel for you both. It hasn't been an easy first half of the year, has it? How are the renovations going? Don't ask. Problem after problem, I'm afraid. And today is no different, but I can't bear to talk about it. How are the girls? Jade and Jude are fine. Sometimes I find myself staring at them and wondering how they got to be so grown up. It's like having three women in the kitchen now. And fine young women they are too. Right, I'm off. The builders are waiting to show me the latest disaster. Sarah rolls her eyes sympathetically. Hopefully it's something they can resolve without too much trouble. We'll see you and Gray on Friday night, if we don't see you before. I'll reserve your favorite table. Kurt joins in amiably. Thank you. Friday feels like an eternity away right now, I reply. Before Gray and I got engaged, Friday was our official date night. Sadly, there were times he couldn't get to Aysbury at all, and then we'd video call instead. It was hard to keep our spirits up, as being apart was agony. And now that we're finally living together, he's working in London again. It's like turning back the clock. Have a great day! I call over my shoulder as I head for the door. I'm thankful to have such good friends. And once I'm out in the fresh air again, the sunshine begins to lift my spirits. There's a light breeze coming off the canal, and I wish I'd worn a thicker jacket over my short-sleeved top. Picking up the pace, I turn left onto the towpath as a tidy-looking 57-foot Delamere narrowboat chugs by, the couple on board waving to me. I wave back with an acknowledging smile. They might be total strangers or people who have stopped here before whom I don't instantly recognize, but it doesn't matter. Boat owners who cruise the canals tend to be a laid-back, friendly bunch. That's another thing I love about living here, and Gray feels the exact same way. With a clear forget-me-not blue sky overhead and the usual hammering sounds echoing across the canal from the marina's workshop, it's a reminder of how lucky we all are to live here. June is my favorite month, 
when everything is green and luscious, with ever-burgeoning splashes of colour appearing in the hedgerows and borders to surprise and delight the walkers. When I focus on breathing in, I can smell the sweetness of the grass and the freshness of the air as it filters through the leaves of the branches overhead. The birds fly in and out, chasing each other and having fun, squabbling like children over the best perch or the tastiest grub. The only hint of the cornfields close by is as the breeze catches the growing stalks. There is a musical rustling in the air when the leaves flap around and the plants sway gently in waves, as if they are being orchestrated. It's easy enough to catch glimpses of the crops where the hedge thins. The ears of corn with their telltale beards have yet to become plump and sweet, but we've already had an exceptional number of sunny days on and off since the beginning of March, which bodes well for a good crop this year. I'm about level with the far end of the car park situated next to the bulrush when a raft of ducks, carried on the wake from the cruiser, decide to head for the bank. As they make their way up the slippery slope to my right, they begin squabbling. The older ones flop down, too intent on a preening session to care about the younger ducks who are fighting to get ahead of each other. One of them waddles higher up the bank to settle down amongst a small patch of longer grass close to the edge of the path. He doesn't even tilt his head to look in my direction, having sensed I'm no threat at all. However, the moment one of the other ducks decides to join him, he becomes extremely vocal. Not all ducks quack, I've discovered, and this one has a raspy grunt. It makes me smile, as it sounds as though he has a sore throat, but he makes enough noise to scare the interloper away. The grass is all the same, no matter where they decide to settle, but I can see it's like a game, and as two of the ducks begin to follow on behind me, being extremely vocal, I chuckle away to myself. When my phone begins to buzz, I'm delighted to see that it's grey. Ah, are you missing me already? I inquire in a sultry tone. I always miss you when I'm away, of course, but actually I'm phoning to say that I left my toothbrush charging by mistake. It's tucked down at the side of the bed because I was using the shaving socket in the bathroom at the time, so you might not spot it. I'll have to go old school with a manual brush. He chuckles to himself. It's not exactly the romantic call I would have liked, but just the sound of Gray's voice is a tonic. He is the reason that everything in my little world is changing, and it won't be long before these annoying little problems at the cottage will be done and dusted. I'm heading back there right now. That'll teach you to rush out the door. Can I help it if you're way too much of a distraction? You just look so darned good with bed hair and sleep in your eyes. Monday mornings are tough, as it's hard to leave you. He's laughing at me, and yet I can feel that little undertone of sadness. It's not easy for either of us. We spent so much time last year wishing away the days between his visits, and now it feels like déjà vu. But then it was because he was looking after Rona, getting her back to full health. Gray was juggling work and being his mother's main support while working from home, so I'm not complaining, because now his mum is settled into a little cottage on the other side of the canal, and when he's not around, I'm here for her. Yes, well, that's the price you pay for being such a successful composer. I'm sorry to cut you short, honey, but I'll ring you tonight at nine, as usual. I'm off to see the builders before they break for lunch. Love you. Mwah. I blow him a noisy kiss, and if I could see his face now, I'd be looking at that big, goofy grin of his. Love you, babe. Bye for now. Amy! I glance up to see Fisher, who took over management of the marina after Tolly retired. He's the man who, when I first came to live here, listened to a little upstart of a teenager going on and on about how my granddad Tolly didn't understand me. I thought I knew it all, and what I wanted was more freedom to do as I pleased. Fisher managed to stop me from getting into trouble by being my sounding board. He didn't always say very much, but when he did, I listened. And now... With Val taking over my part-time job in the marina's office so that I can work full-time at the nurseries, I miss that daily contact with him. The ritual of making him two cups of strong coffee first thing in the morning in quick succession and knowing not to disturb him until he drained the second one always made me smile. I also miss the times we'd spend our lunch breaks together in the bulrush, putting the world to rights, cementing that special bond between us. 
I pick up the pace, and as Fisher steps down onto the towpath, I stride over to give him a hug. You smell nice, I remark as he wraps me in his arms and rocks me back and forth on my feet playfully. Do I? He replies cagily. I gaze up at him, shaking my head. You're off to Val's for lunch, aren't you? I inquire, sounding the teensiest bit accusatory. You never used to let me slope off early at lunchtime. I wondered why she wasn't in work. Mm. I can't recall you ever offering to make me lunch, darling girl, he declares, smiling wickedly. I'm still getting used to thinking of Fisher and Val as a couple, but they were both battling with loneliness, and since they've started dating, it's been lovely to see them getting on so well. Fisher's ex-wife left him for a widower with two children of primary school age. He was heartbroken, not just because they weren't blessed with a child, but because he thought they'd come to terms with that blow. They were working towards a plan for a different kind of future, one that could give them a level of freedom. Step one was to be mortgage-free, but that meant working longer hours in the day jobs. Fisher bought the Stargazer, a 57-foot Colcraft narrowboat, spending every spare hour he had to strip her back to a shell and turn her into a pleasure cruiser. And then, with no warning at all, his world was turned upside down. Their stunning barn conversion was sold, and now he lives in a modest little cottage in one of the winding lanes behind the marina. He takes little trips along the canal from time to time, but at Christmas, the stargazer turns into the Santa Ahoy special, which is when she really comes alive. And a good lunch it will be, I'm sure, I muse, smiling at him. His eyes light up, and I can see that he feels he's been rumbled. I'm in need of some home cooking today, he replies, sounding sorry for himself, which is not like Fisher. What's up? Anything I can help with? No, I'm just wrestling with the decision about whether or not to make the formal application to take early retirement the Christmas after next and start the ball rolling. As you know, it was a foregone conclusion, but, well, what was once a no-brainer now has question marks all over it. If you want to come round to Lockkeeper's Cottage one evening for a quiet chat. I stop short, remembering that if this latest hiccup at the cottage is as bad as my gut instincts are warning me, I might be moving out for a while. On second thoughts, it would be easier if I come to you. All is not well back at the cottage, apparently, and there might not be a quick fix. Fisher shakes his head sadly. That's disappointing to hear, Emmy. It can't be easy juggling everything you have on your plate, with a constant upheaval going on around you. And thanks, I will be in touch, as I'd like to run a couple of things past you before I say anything to Val. What on earth? I stand with my mouth open, unable to believe the devastation. It looks a lot worse than it is, Emmy, Reggie calls out as he hurries over to me. The beautiful old flagstone patio to the rear of Lockkeeper's Cottage is now little more than a mud pit, and in the center of it is a big hole. Has Tolly seen this? I ask, hardly daring to think about his reaction. Yes, he heard the commotion when the pipe fractured. We calmed him down and he instructed us to remove the flagstones, which are now safely stacked in the outhouse, so don't worry. Where is Tolly now? He's in the retreats. He, um, has a visitor. The original patio area is Tolly's pride and joy, and now it's just a muddy expanse. What happened? It's hard to mask the anxiety I'm feeling. The sweeping border of perennial ladies' mantle with their soft round leaves, has been decimated, and the spiky blue sea holly with the steely blue stems have all been flattened. The gush of water was obviously so fierce that it has also washed out much of the soil. It's a total mess. The pipes are old, Emmy. Everything needs replacing, and having had a look, I'm afraid that includes the septic tank. I didn't like to ask Tolly the question, but why on earth wasn't all this dug up when the work was done on the retreat? It would have been easier to link the two together and get it all sorted in one go. Reggie's frustration is clear. I know, and that makes perfect sense now, but it wasn't that simple at the time. When I turned 18, I wanted to spread my wings a little. While I would never leave Tolly on his own, I wanted my privacy. 
the decision was made to use the legacy my dad left me to turn the retreat from a basic rental property into my future home. The property was put in my name, but Tolly didn't want me to limit my options for the future in case I ever wanted to move away. It's a totally independent building and, if necessary, could be divided off and sold as a separate dwelling. Reggie scratches his head, staring at me as if that's a crazy idea. And now that Lockkeeper's Cottage is home for you and Gray, you're landed with an unexpected expense. I know, it means a lot to Tolly that we turn the cottage into our forever home, I explain. I couldn't see beyond the excitement of having my own place at the time. Getting married or even moving into the cottage wasn't something I'd given any thought to whatsoever. Reggie raises his eyebrows, a grim expression on his face. Well, this is the price you pay, I'm afraid. We'll have to run new pipes from the stopcock right through to where the supply feeds into the property, which is out on the towpath. The water pipe runs along the side of the cottage and around the back as the stop tap is in the kitchen. When we dug up the footings for the extension on the other side, we didn't find any pipes at all. What I can't figure out is that when we fitted the new kitchen, the pipework coming up through the concrete floor was fairly new, so this is a real shock looking into the hole and seeing the state of it. The kitchen flooded a few years back and it was something to do with the water pipe under the sink. I remember the plumber drilling out a hole in the concrete floor and then cementing it back up afterwards, I confirm. At the time it was simply an inconvenience as the water had seeped through into the sitting room and the carpet had to be replaced. I try hard not to sigh. The budget Gray and I allocated for the new extension includes the cost of the re-plumbing work so that part of it has already been spent. All we have left that isn't already earmarked is the contingency fund and some money we've set aside to buy new furniture. Can you give me a ballpark figure of the cost to put it right? Well, a robust, low-maintenance sewage treatment system like a BioPure is going to set you back probably three and a half grand alone. And the cost of the labor involved to do both jobs? Another couple of grand at least. It depends on whether we hit any snags. It's going to add at least a couple of weeks, maybe a month to the deadline, Emmy. I need to sort our schedule and see who I can free up to help out with the trench work. But in the meantime, there'll be no facilities in the cottage whatsoever. The look of sympathy on Reggie's face is sincere. Well, I suppose I'm glad this happened now and not after the building work was completed. I'll pop in to have a word with Tolly next. The office will email you a detailed breakdown of the costs as soon as the final figures are available. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, Emmy, when the end was nearly in sight. If we'd been made aware of the age of those pipes, it would have been the first thing we tackled. It's not your fault, Reggie, and thanks for being diplomatic with Tolly. I've been on at him for the last ten years about letting things slide, and I know he's going to feel guilty about it now. I suppose the upside is that everything will be new. As I turn and walk across to the retreat, the figures are going around and around inside my head. We are definitely heading for a significant overspend, and it's money Gray and I simply don't have. And, unfortunately, there isn't a penny spare in the wedding budget, which was modest to begin with. I won't break the news to Gray until he's back on Friday, and by then, hopefully, I will have a better idea of what the bottom line will be. Chapter 3 The Surprises Keep on Coming Well, this is rather pleasant, Rona says, picking up her cup of Earl Grey tea and nestling back against the cushions on Val's sofa. She's obviously delighted to be involved in the wedding planning, and I don't know why I didn't think of it myself. Ziggy appears, and after making sure she gets a stroke from each of us, she runs back upstairs, no doubt to settle down under the bed. Val has been baking, and it doesn't take any encouragement at all to get me to tuck into one of her spiced apple buns. Mmm, I mumble as I savour the first mouthful. This is delicious, and what a treat to perk me up. Wednesday's always a bit of a slump day for me. At least when tomorrow dawns, I can say that Grey will be home the following day. Both Rona and Val look at me, their expressions tinged with sadness. It's such a pity that Grey is back working in London again. I know that Rona misses her son as much as I do. 
Come on, ladies, let's not dwell on things we can't change. Let's figure out where things stand so we can draw up an action plan. I was beginning to think this wedding was going to end up being postponed for a second time, and we can't have that, can we? Val states matter-of-factly. Having just picked up a second bun and taken a huge bite, I smile back at her, gratefully. It's so exciting, Rona replies. After the disappointment of moving back into the retreat, this will help raise your spirits, Immy. I demolish what's left of the bun and quickly wipe my mouth. Talking of Dolly, do either of you know a woman named Daphne Harris? Val shakes her head, but Rona leans forward to place her empty cup on the coffee table, and I notice she's pressing her lips together, as if deep in thought. Well, it might not be the same woman, but shortly after I moved to Aysbury, I had a call from someone of that name. She lives at Middle Norton. Daphne runs the Women's Institute there, and one of my old friends put us in touch. Why? Tolly mentioned her name in passing, I reply, trying to sound only mildly curious. However, the two women look at each other, puzzled by my interest. She's not from Aysbury. I can't ever recall hearing her name before, and Tolly immediately changed the subject. It just struck me as a little odd, that's all. I expect it's something to do with fundraising, Val offers. Yes, that's probably it, Rona adds, sensing my unease. Well, let's keep this between ourselves, but if you hear anything about her, perhaps you could let me know. Tolly is saying nothing, which is unlike him. Besides, I'm the treasurer, and if it's a new initiative, then I can't see why they didn't involve me. I sincerely hope he doesn't feel that I'm not able to keep everything ticking over satisfactorily. Val looks at me, reaching over to squeeze my arm affectionately. Tolly is probably trying to give you a little space, Emmy. He likes to feel he's pulling his weight, and he's not one to sit around when we still have a long way to go to reach the target. I roll my eyes. I know. Now that the land has been fenced off, it's time to give thought to the timeline we should be working to in order to pay the deposit and meet the subsequent payments for the playground equipment. They begin building it six weeks before installation, but the deposit must be paid at least a month beforehand. That reminds me. I need to check with Tolly to see how it's going with the council and the transfer once it's all done. Val begins clearing the coffee table. Right, that's enough of that for now. Tonight we focus on the task in hand. I'll just take this out to the kitchen while Rona grabs our to-do list. I dive into my bag and grab copies of the menus Sarah emailed across. When Val returns, I hand them out. These are sample menus. I'll be going through them with Gray at the weekend, but as his eyes glaze over every time I begin to talk about the finer details, as he refers to them, I would really value your input. Has he decided who he wants to invite yet? Rona inquires. No, and I've asked him so many times it's now becoming a bit of a thing between us. Do you want me to have a word with him? I'm not making excuses, but when Gray has his head into his music, it does tend to blot out everything else, she replies empathetically. I nod my head as I know exactly what she means. Gray and I can be having a serious conversation, and suddenly he jumps up to grab his iPad and disappears because inspiration is calling. Often, he's gone for ages, which can be rather inconvenient at times, but I've grown accustomed to it. If you get a chance before Saturday, then that would be great. I'm going to take him off for a walk so I can ensure that I have his full attention I've no idea how many of his ex-colleagues in London he regards as friends, given that I've never met any of them in person. However, he talks about them often. Now he's self-employed, it's a different matter yet again. The London studio where he's working links up to the film studios in Los Angeles, apparently, where the film is being made. So maybe there will be people there he'll want to invite. But in all honesty, all I want is a little gathering of the people who are closest to us both. Leave it with us, Emmy. You're snowed under, and Gray needs to understand that. As busy as he is, you need him to step up and make a few decisions as well. If you intend to tackle him about the menu over the weekend, Val and I will pull together a couple of suggestions and email them over to you on Friday. It would be nice to get that sorted and off to Sarah on Monday. Now, let's whip down the tick list, in no particular order. Flowers, speeches, will there be an evening party after the lunchtime buffet? It's question after question, but at least the ensuing discussions are productive. 
A plan is beginning to take shape, but there is still a long list of details to be thrashed out. Good, now we are finally getting somewhere, and it wasn't that bad, was it? Val prompts, waiting for me to agree. When I don't reply, she stares at me pointedly. I suppose that brings us back to the dress and the location again. Amy, are you sure the village hall is the right place to hold the wedding and the reception? Rona inquires delicately. It's the simplest solution, I confirm. Yes, but, Val continues, this is your wedding day we're talking about. You deserve something a little bit more romantic and inspiring. This is a day you will both remember forever, and hopefully tell your children all about in the years to come. They're right, of course, and I wish I had this wonderful vision in my head that I could share with them. I often dream of Grey and I exchanging our vows, but it's always just the two of us, staring into each other's eyes. You're right, it's not what I want at all, but it's booked now. The fact that it's an approved premises in which to hold a civil wedding means we don't have to traipse between the church and the reception. Who wants to do that in winter? Both Rona and Val look at me, shocked. This is not the time to be practical, Emmy. It's about making your dreams come true. That does it. We'll cancel it tomorrow, Val declares adamantly. What do you really want? Rona asks, pressing me.